He's 6'11", 265 pounds, and doesn't want anyone to interfere with his mission. My mission uh, was to preach God's word you know, in the NBA. Houston Rockets star Dwight Howard looks back at his NBA career. Stay strong. Don't give up. Don't quit. Plus, it just takes five minutes, and it could save your marriage. Get the secret on today's 700 Club. Well, some of you were up late watching the returns out of New Hampshire, and it was a huge win for the Donald. Uh, Fred Barnes, in a column, said it looks like nothing can stop him now from getting the nomination, that he will go on to be the nominee of the Republican Party. Well, that still is probably in question, but uh, not too much. The real question for Republicans is uh, uh, who's going to drop out, who's going to stay in the race? Uh, Kasich was second in New Hampshire, but Trump beat him two to one. Uh, so, you know, what's going on, I Wendy? Think you called Kasich. Hmm? You called Kasich last night. Oh, Good yeah, job. absolutely. Well, Kasich mm -hmm. is, 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 without question, is, is the most able person out there. Uh, he's really good. He, uh, I, I thought an unbeatable combination was Bush and Kasich, but Bush mm -hmm. hasn't come through as strong. He might hit it. He thinks he might hit it in South Carolina. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but Trump goes in there with thousands of people in his back pocket, and he doesn't spend any money to speak of on advertising. He gets all free advertising. It's a phenomenon that I cannot explain, but it is out there. Well, on the Democratic side, socialist Bernie Sanders crushed Hillary Clinton, but Clinton is still the favorite to get her party's nomination. Caitlin Burke brings us this look at the results from the primary vote in the Granite State. Republican Donald Trump and Democrat Bernie Sanders crushed their competition in New Hampshire, leaving no question that voters in the Granite State are angry at Washington and worried about the economy. We are going to make America so great again, maybe greater than ever before. Together, we have sent the message that will echo from Wall Street to Washington. While the wins were expected, the big story coming out of New Hampshire on the Republican side was the tight race for the places behind Donald Trump. Kasich finished a clear second, with Cruz, Bush, and Rubio close behind. That could end up prolonging the Republican nominating contest as voters decide between the different candidates. If you don't have a seatbelt, go get one. We're going to shake this country. You all have reset the race, and for that, I am really happy. Meanwhile, Clinton trying to look at her loss in New Hampshire positively, saying the outcome was expected, but the future looks good. Now we take this campaign to the entire country. We are going to fight for every vote in every state. But as the candidates now begin a battle for the South, some analysts say Sanders may not be as easy to shake off as Clinton predicts especially if he can close his polling gap in South Carolina and beyond. On the Republican side, the top questions moving forward, who moves on to South Carolina, who drops out now, and who becomes the primary alternative to Donald Trump? Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Uh, I wouldn't be in Hillary Clinton's shoes right now for the world because, man, the knives are out for her, and if, the, if she gets indicted, on, on all this uh, scandal, uh, it, it's going to cripple uh, the Democratic Party uh, in this election. I, I just don't understand what they're doing. Well, our political correspondent, uh, David Brody, joins us now from Manchester. Hey, David, uh, is Kasich, uh, in your opinion, a one-trick pony, or has he got some, some legs to go on the, the next part of the race? Well, I think he's a one-trick pony at this point, Pat, but there's a big asterisk with uh, John Kasich, and that is, uh, will Marco Rubio, will Jeb Bush, will they all kind of start to fade and get out of the race, and then Kasich becomes that establishment alternative, and I think that's what the Kasich campaign is hoping for. Look, I mean, Kasich did, quote, well here on Tuesday night, but then again, what is well? As you said at the top of the show, he lost to Trump two to one. Uh, the, the problem is he was running for, in essence, governor of New Hampshire up here. I mean, basically, he was spending a lot of time here. Uh, he had a great ground game. The problem is he's not going to do well in South Carolina. At least that's the sense. He'll get a little bit of a bounce, but uh, Trump's the guy to beat in South Carolina. I don't think there's any question about that. And Ted 
Cruz obviously is going to do well there with a, a GOP electorate made up predominantly of evangelical Christians. Sixty percent, Pat, in South Carolina make up that primary audience. Uh, did you see Fred Barnes? He had an um, article I read today indicating that Trump is at this point basically unbeatable, that he's just going to carry it on through. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know about unbeatable, but I will tell you this. If Donald Trump wins South Carolina, uh, then we can start to uh, basically go down that unbeatable uh, scenario. And why is that? Well, look, I mean, after South Carolina comes those SEC primary states, and I know the Cruz campaign says they are solid in those states, in those southern states. Uh, the, the problem, though, is that with Donald Trump winning New Hampshire, then potentially winning South Carolina, he's going to have so much momentum at that point that that Trump train that we hear so much about could could indeed be leaving the station in those SEC primaries. Remember, Pat, Donald Trump has had huge rallies down there, 20,000, 30,000 in Mobile and other places. I mean, he's he's a force in the South. He's not it's not just Ted Cruz. And so uh, he is a force to be reckoned with. And boy, I tell you what, there are a lot of people scratching their heads over it. Uh, but here he is, Pat. Well, you know, the governor of New Jersey did a number on <laughs> poor old Rubio. Uh, you know, it was it was absolutely brutal. Uh, it didn't help him much, but it certainly didn't wound uh, Rubio. Where do Bush and Rubio go from here, in your opinion? Well, boy, uh, it is a going to be a nasty drag out, drag down fight in South Carolina, not only between Trump and Cruz, but Bush and Rubio. Look, uh, as a matter of fact, the Bush campaign already putting out an internal memo saying it is time to basically kneecap, take down Rubio and Kasich in South Carolina. So we got two different fights going on in South Carolina, Trump and Cruz. It's going to be nasty. Then Bush, Rubio, Kasich, all in that other lane. And it's going to be nasty there. And Bush is going to be the entire there's no question about it. The question for Rubio is, where does he win exactly? I mean, you know, it was third in Iowa, and he was excited about that. But then he regressed here in New Hampshire. South Carolina looks like it's going to be a Trump cruise affair. So Rubio probably not going to do as well in South Carolina. And then the SEC primaries. And so uh, you, you wonder where Bush wins. You wonder where Rubio wins. Quite frankly, Pat, you wonder where Kasich wins. Maybe March 8th in Michigan, potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's far down the road. And the uh, Trump train may be leaving the station at that point. And then there's March 15th, the Ohio GOP primary, where Kasich should do well. But will he be in the race at that point? Probably, but that might be his last stand. Uh, what about Sanders? You know, he's uh, Brooklyn. Uh, he's a socialist. He's in his 70s. I mean, at, at what point does he drop by the wayside and Hillary takes over? There's nobody else out there besides her. If, if he falls, what do you think? Well, there's so many, uh, so much to unpack here. First of all, if you're losing by 20 plus points to a 74 year old socialist, uh, you got some issues. I don't think there's any question about it, Pat. Uh, look, here's the thing. Uh, Bernie Sanders won up here with uh, young voters. He won up here on the trust issue. And most importantly for Hillary Clinton, and this is a bad thing for the Clinton campaign, uh, Bernie Sanders won with female voters. And so now there is this perception that Hillary Clinton is going to have to do some new outreach to a younger, more female uh, a crowd that she used to have 20 plus years ago doesn't have those folks today. She goes to Nevada, South Carolina, uh, where she's doing better, much better in the polls. But Bernie's going to get a bounce from this for sure. I do want to bring up something real quick about Ted Cruz before I forget, because you know you never know with lack of sleep, I may forget it, Pat. Uh, but you know Ted Cruz's third place finish in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty big story. The media's not giving it much attention, but let's remember uh, Ted Cruz is the quote evangelical candidate, or at least that's in quotes. Uh, and then he comes to New Hampshire in Libertarian, live free or die New Hampshire, and does a pretty solid third. Uh, that's called, as I like to call it, a T-evangelical message. He can play to evangelicals. He can play to the Tea Party. Uh, so he's a force. I don't think there's any question about it. And I think this Trump Cruz thing is going to get real nasty. Uh, last question. Uh, you've been observing this, and I certainly have. Not only have I observed it, I've been in one of them. But I've never seen anything like this ever. What do you think? <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't either. I mean, this, this is just, it, it's really 
an, an amazing race, uh, to quote, I believe, a CBS show, right? Uh, you know, D Donald Trump has played to the angry electorate that's out there. They're frustrated. They're angry. A lot of evangelicals are sick and tired of what's been going on as well. And he's playing to some of those evangelicals as well. Remember, uh, Donald Trump actually comes in second in the evangelical vote. He did it in Iowa. He'll probably do it again in South Carolina. So he's playing to a sick and tired audience. And that's why Chris Christie most likely will be out of this race, because he wanted that angry electorate. Uh, he was the, quote, you know, guy that was frustrated and angry. But Donald Trump took up the real estate, no pun intended. Uh, that Chris Christie wanted. And, and I, I tell you, Pat, there is something called uh, an intangible. There is emotion in politics. And there is a great book called The Politics of Emoting by Drew Weston, a political science professor at Emory University. He talks about how people don't really vote with their brain. They vote with their heart. And Donald Trump clearly has resonated. He has basically formed a love connection, if you will, uh, with many of the voters around this country. It's, it's really astonishing. Well, he's coming down here to be on this program and be at Regent in another week or two. And uh, we'll, he's been a friend of mine for years and years and years. But who in the world would have thought it, Dave? I can't believe it that this guy is a, he's a gambling uh, empresario, a real estate developer, and suddenly he just wins it all. Okay, David Brody, God Pat, bless you. Pat, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Pat. Well, in other news, uh, one of our top intelligence officials is warning the Islamic terrorists from ISIS will try more attacks on the United States this year. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. That warning from the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, at a hearing on Capitol Hill. Clapper testified that ISIS will either try to launch an attack on the U.S., or will inspire terrorism here, even without direct guidance of ISIS, ISIS leadership. He also called the radical Islamic group, quote, the preeminent terror threat, saying ISIS can direct and inspire attacks against a wide range of targets around the world. Clapper also warned North Korea is now the top nuclear threat to the United States ahead of Iran. He said the North is producing nuclear material and working on ballistic a ballistic missile capable of being launched from a submarine. Today, the Senate is moving to punish North Korea for its recent rocket launches and nuclear weapons program. Senators are considering a bill that targets the regime's ability to access cash because the North has been developing miniaturized nuclear warheads and long-range missiles to deliver them. Japan is also looking to impose sanctions to protest the rocket launch. These moves come as United Nations experts reveal North Korea has been evading existing sanctions using airlines, ships, and the international financial system, Pat, to trade prohibited items and its nuclear, for its nuclear and ballistic missiles program. You know, um, I was in North Korea, a place called Chando Ri, uh, with the 1st Marine Division way, way back when. Uh, we had a chance to win up there, but we didn't. Uh, we threw it away. Uh, I, I worry about North Korea. They're a tiny, tiny little country. Uh, their, their GDP is like a little pinprick. It's nothing compared to the United States. But everything they have is from China. So if China continues to trade, continues to open up credit, continues to let them uh, do what they do, then the North Koreans are not going to be dissuaded from their action because of some sanctions. But the question is, if they have an internet, uh, internet, uh, continental ballistic missile capable of reaching the United States of America with a nuclear payload, we are in serious trouble. It would only take one nuke to wipe out Los Angeles or San Francisco or Chicago or anything else. And the, the, the damage and the tr tragedy and the devastation to this nation would be beyond calculation. And what are we going to do about it? Well, you've got a president who isn't going to do anything. But others are coming in. Should we move in militarily? Uh, we could have beaten them a long time ago with no trouble at all. The trouble is if we move too fast against North Korea, they, they have a big force right close to the border of Seoul with, with South Korea. And they could uh, let artillery uh, barrages go forth and other uh, weapons. They've got rockets. They've got all kinds of uh, firepower. They could demolish Seoul, which is a you know, prosperous city.
for those of you who've been over there, uh, it's uh, so the South Korea uh, don't want that, and yet we don't know what to ha happen. I mean, uh, it's it's a a crime family masquerading as a nation, as one of our congressmen said, and that's what it is. I mean, the, the Kim Jong Il and his uh, progeny uh, are, are criminals. But what are we going to do about it? And I tell you, it needs some prayer. It needs some major thought. And I, I don't think that we've got anybody who's putting his mind on what to do next that's going to restrain those people. John? Pat, a major setback for the Obama administration. In a 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court has put a stop to the president's sweeping plan to crack down on carbon emissions from power plants. The regulations were designed to cut carbon dioxide emissions at power plants by about a third by the year 2030. But the court put the plan on hold until legal challenges are worked out. The decision is a big victory for the coalition of 27 mostly Republican-led states and industry opponents who call the regulations an unprecedented power grab. And Pat, many court watchers believe the ruling signals the justices were won over by strong arguments against those rules. Well, this is a grab by uh, our good friend Obama, who's trying to jam the progressive agenda down the throats of the American people by every means known to man. And I congratulate the Supreme Court for staying in his way, but he, well, they had a whole lot of states uh, lining up uh, on the uh, uh, opposing him, uh, bringing that lawsuit. So it wasn't just a few lone uh, plaintiffs. It was a major force saying, this is a killer. We can't let it happen. So it's uh, the day after the election, and what is your? Did you sit up watching that? I stuff? did. It was great. It was a great night yeah. to be an American and to see our democratic yeah. system working. Yeah, it was amazing. Okay. And you know, if you like the results, it was better. Yeah, well, it, it, <laughs> it was, was remarkable. I, but I, it, 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 <laughs> I don't think anybody was surprised. But I, I think uh, Kasich showing was uh, important, and I, I think. Uh, but even so, the fact that. As strong as he was, and he was very strong, Trump had him two to one. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. nobody was really, everybody was so excited about the second place winner well, that they really weren't even talking about that. So well, it was an interesting night. Definitely. All right. Well, still ahead, the eight-time all-star NBA powerhouse and once the Superman of the slam dunk, Dwight Howard talks about his mission on and off the court. That's coming up later. But first, what can get the U.S. economy going again? You'll find out when we come back. If you're an investor, you're wondering, where do I put my money? Uh, and I don't think many people have the answer right now. The stock market has been in free fall since the beginning of January, and the U.S. economy has been stagnating for years. So what's the cure? Well, it could be as simple as cutting taxes on business. Take a look. The latest figures show the economy barely moving in the last three months of 2015, with economic growth coming at just seven-tenths of one percent in the fourth quarter. Even though unemployment has fallen, millions of Americans have simply given up looking for work, and those who are working face another problem. Their income hasn't been going up much in recent years either. So what's the solution to slow economic growth? Is it more government spending or programs or something else? Some economists point to another answer. They say the taxes on American businesses are just too high. The federal corporate tax rate is 35%, one of the highest in the world. Even European countries have lower tax rates. Some critics say U.S. businesses have write-offs. But critics point to businesses like Burger King and others that have moved their headquarters to other countries to pay lower taxes. Some of the Republican candidates have plans to cut the business tax rate, and even President Obama has talked about cutting it. But so far, nothing has happened in Washington, and nothing will unless the next president, whoever that is, supports it. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dave. Well, with us is Stephen Moore. He's an economist with the Heritage Foundation and Freedom Works. It's a pleasure always to have him with us. Okay. What do you think of the election? 
I am so happy. <laughs> I'm happy because you know what we found out last night, Pat? What's the... She is not going to be president of the United States. <laughs> she is not going to be president. Okay. And uh, there's just no way. I mean, she's only getting, you know, 40 percent of the Democrat vote. Yeah. I, I have a lot of uh, liberal Democratic friends who are very nervous today because they realize they've got a, a losing ticket. Um, on the Republican side, I think it's, you know, Trump is an amazing political phenomenon, isn't he? I mean, no, have you ever no, seen anything like this? Never, 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 uh, never. I mean, if we had been sitting here a year ago, and I had told you that Donald Trump, you know, was in, in first well, place and I could be the Republican nominee. He would have I was drinking. Um, he, I have to say this, and I don't have a horse in this race, but yeah. I, I thought his speech last night was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It was patriotic. It was pro-business. It was pro-America. Uh, the more I see him, the more he, he comes across as sort of the anti-Obama, -Ob yeah, right? Yeah. He's a man of accomplishment, a businessman who has hired people. He is he, he exudes patriotism. He loves America. Obama's always blaming things on America. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, that's very attractive to voters. But it ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. You know, I, all those young people and hear this old man, this old socialist, <laughs> Uh, saying all these things, and these kids, and they, they, I don't know if you listen to these speeches, but you know, they kept cheering over and over he again. He got eighty percent of the voters under the age of, of twenty nine. Uh, Bernie Sanders did. Well, I mean, and, it, and that's it, an amazing it, thing. Is that like the kids that want to do a panty raid in a, in a fraternity? I mean, is it kind of? Well, want... first of all, it's an indictment of our education system in oh, America. Boy, when these college it? graduates think yeah. that socialism is an economic model that works, I mean. Show me anywhere in the world, Bernie Sanders, where socialism is, hasn't mm -hmm. worked. I mean, look at Greece, for goodness sakes, yeah. it's bankrupt. Well, he, look, he at, look, at, look at Argentina, look at France, look at, look at Detroit, I mean, yeah. look at Puerto Rico. All of the socialist states are going bankrupt. He wants a 90% uh, top tax, and he kept inveighing against the, the billionaire class. How many billionaires have we got? You know, the yeah, whole thing is took, absurd. Even if you took every penny from every billionaire in the United States, 100% yeah. tax rate, you couldn't run the government for, for three or four months. That means that if you want the big spending programs that mm -hmm. Obama came out with yesterday, yeah. or, uh, or Hillary Clinton has endorsed, or Bernie Sanders, you know where the money has to come from? It has to come from the middle class. Yeah. They are going to raise taxes on the middle class if they want, uh, but they're not. <laughs> well, the middle class has really been hurt by it's their, been their, crushed. their. All right, what is your solution? What would you do to solve this thing? Because there is a malaise that's there is. settled upon. That's us. a good way to describe what's going yeah. on in the economy, a malaise. So the irony of Obama's presidency is, you know, this has been a recovery, but but it is. Trump, I mean, uh, Sanders is right about this. All of the gains under Obama have gone to the top 10%. Most mm -hmm. of the people in the bottom 90% haven't seen a pay raise. Mm -hmm. They, you know, anybody who thinks that five, the unemployment rate is 5%, that's one of the biggest lie statistics. Mm -hmm. The real unemployment rate in this country is 10%, Pat, because we're not counting people who've just it's become so out. discouraged, yeah. they've just dropped out. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are real problems. The middle class has actually lost income mm -hmm. during the Obama presidency. This, I've been studying this stuff for 30 years. Yeah. This is the first time I've seen an economic recovery from recession when the middle class actually lost ground. And that's why voters are so cranky, they're angry, and they're anxiety ridden. What do they do? I mean, a middle class guy, he's losing ground. What does he do to make ends meet? It's tough. I mean, people are, that's why when Barack Obama last week, you know, did his, uh, you know, Super Bowl shuffle in the end zone oh, on the economy, yeah. people are saying, what country is he talking about? People, when they pay their bills at the kitchen table, mm -hmm. you see the rising cost of tuition, rising cost of health care. They're just having a hard time. Now, I, I, when you ask, you know, what do we do, Pat, about this economy? Mm -hmm. Why, why not help businesses? I mean, you yeah. know, since when is it, uh, when is it, uh, did we create villains out of businessmen and women who create the jobs in this country? We need to honor businessmen and women who create the jobs, who sign the paychecks. We haven't done that in a long time in this country. Well, you figure you've got the federal tax. We talk 35%, yeah. but that's just federal. Closer the, to 40, the, actually. Yeah, well, well, they have, you you well, they mean have the to business pay, tax? Yeah, the yeah. business, and they have to pay uh, state taxes. Yeah. And if you go out in California, you it's just it. a draconian. And then there are other fees on top of that. So the, uh, at what disadvantage are we? Huge, huge. Yeah. You just had that little segment about all these companies that are leaving. Yeah. I mean, Burger King. 
One of our great, um, one of our greatest drug companies, Pfizer, mm -hmm. has left. Uh, we have countries like Medtronic, uh, Walgreens has talked about leaving. Shouldn't the alarm bells be going mm -hmm. off in Washington? There's something wrong here when our companies are leaving for Canada, they're leaving for Ireland, they're leaving for China. Uh, you know, Trump is right about this. We've got to bring those companies back to America. And the way you do that, and I, I testified last week before mm -hmm. the House Ways and Means Committee said, cut the tax rate. Uh, you know, Reagan proved when you cut yeah. the tax rates, businesses come back, you create more jobs. That's the best way to, to have well, revenue. Some of these demagogues are saying, well, look, we just need to punish these people. They're, they're, they're uh, just tax scoff laws and they're, you know, taking advantage of this great country. That's not true at all. No, you know, my, my father, uh, who I, is 93 years old, a yeah. World War II veteran, still, still alive and kicking, you know, he puts for 40 years, he put the sweat, sweat equity into his small business and mm -hmm. filled it up, you know, and, and, and uh, he became a millionaire because he put so much, uh, so much of his, he used to be gone a lot. My point is, we should honor those people who yeah, build the businesses. Sure. You know, I, you know, I love that about Donald Trump. I love that about, you know, whether it's uh, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, the people great, you know, to treat them as if somehow they are stealing from our country when they're the people who create the hundreds and thousands of but millions of jobs. The president has done that. He's, he's, he's a class divider in chief. We have never had a never president had never had who it. set one class against another the way this man has. And his budget, which didn't get a lot of publicity, it came out mm -hmm. yesterday as last budget, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> His last budget has trillions of dollars of new taxes. By the way, do you, don't you love, I, I, when I'm here in Virginia Beach, when we drove here from the airport, $1.55 a gallon for gasoline. Oh, now, man. that's a wonderful yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Obama wants to put a ten dollar a gallon, a ten dollar a barrel uh, ch charge on this. That's going to raise the gasoline price by another twenty five or thirty cents a gallon. I mean, my goodness, Mr. President, give the middle class a break here. I mean, how is that, that going to help the middle class to tax a, the oil? A slush fund for all of these uh, green know, energy boondog, programs, green energy yeah. that. Solyndra and others that haven't worked. You know, we ha when you talk about how we can rebuild this economy, I'll mm -hmm. tell you one way we All can right. do this. We have more oil and gas and coal than any other country in the yes. world. Yes. We ought to be developing those resources. Those are good paying jobs. Those are jobs that pay 60, sure. 80, 100 thousand dollars a year. This president, he wants to kill the coal industry. I mean, we're here in Virginia. This is a coal mm -hmm. state. Right. There are whole towers that have been decimated oh, by yeah, this man. Yeah. Um, so we ought to, and but we could do this, Pat. Write this down. In five years, if we get a pro-America, pro-energy uh, president, we could be energy independent for the first time in 50 years. That is to say, we could be producing more energy than we're buying. That means we don't have to buy the oil from the Middle East. That's yeah. going to keep us safer. I mean, why in the world wouldn't we want to do that? Well, because of progressive An ideology. ideology. It's, yeah. it's, uh, but the people who are being hurt by that ideology are the middle class, because yeah. those are the jobs that are being destroyed. Thank you so but I'm not, look, I'm optimistic. I don't want to end this on a pessimistic yeah, okay. note. I think we get a pro-America, pro-business president. We're going to see a boom in this country in 2017. I really believe that. But it's been restrained for so long. Yep. It, it, you know, it's time to explode. Amen. Steve, well, thank you so yeah, much. Great to be with you again. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, there's hope. This great nation is like Gulliver and the Lilliputians. The, 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 the pygmies have held us down. Now let's get rid of the pygmies and let the giants stand up. Wendy. Great interview. Thanks, Pat. Well, up next, Houston Rocket Dwight Howard talks about his explosive career. Everybody made me look like the worst guy in the world, a coach killer, a guy who hates his teammates, a cancer, all this stuff that I'm not. Find out why this NBA superstar is a man with a mission and hear how nothing can stop him. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. We're so glad to have you with us on this day after the New Hampshire election. And uh, we're on the way. It'll be one right after the other coming up quickly. Well, once nicknamed Superman, Dwight Howard is a, uh, an NBA icon. Uh, in 2004, he came into the league straight out of high school, still wearing braces on his teeth. <laughs> well, he grew up in front of millions of fans, making some very public mistakes along the way. But as he told Sean Brown, no matter what, he remains faithful to his mission.
Over the past 12 seasons, few players have been more dominant inside the paint than Houston Rockets' Dwight Howard. The eight-time All-Star entered the league the first overall pick in the 2004 NBA draft, fresh out of high school. Coming into the league, you had a mission. What was the mission? My mission uh, was to preach God's word you know, in the NBA, use the NBA as a platform for God. But for a 19-year-old entering the NBA, Dwight says it was a daily struggle to stay focused on God. There was times where it was very overwhelming, where it's like, man, this is so much, and everything is at my disposal. You know, all I got to do is just go reach, and it's mine. In nine seasons with the Magic, Dwight became a three-time Defensive Player of the Year, made six All-Star Game appearances, and became the franchise's all-time leading scorer. But with success came temptation. And in 2007, he became a father and wasn't married. And he took a lot of heat because of it. If you're a professional athlete and you come out and tell the world, hey, I'm a Christian, for some reason, for people that don't quite understand what that means, all of a sudden believe that you can't make mistakes. That is correct. When I came out, you know, I want everybody to know that I am a man of faith. I believe in God and I will always believe in him. And, you know, the minute I messed up, the minute I sinned, everybody took a shot at me. Hey, you're supposed to be a Christian, but Jesus died on the cross for our sins, you know? So if he's willing to forgive us, why can't we forgive each other? Towards the end of the 2012 season, rumors of friction between him, his coach, and teammates began to brew. Everybody made me look like the, the worst guy in the world, a coach killer, a guy who hates his teammates, a cancer, all this stuff that I'm not. Then in August, Dwight was traded to the Lakers. There, it was difficult for him to play at a high level because he still needed time to heal from surgery. You know, I'm trying to play, but I'm still not 100%, you know? And I was getting demolished for that. Ah, oh, he's not playing hard enough. He can't dunk anymore. He can't do this. And I'm like, God, why do I have to go through this? But he said, just keep going. You know, just stay strong. When the season concluded, Dwight was a free agent and decided to leave Los Angeles and sign with the Rockets. And that didn't go over well with Laker fans. And now everybody hates me again. I'm like, oh my God, like God, like please just do something. And you know, he said, listen, man, if the whole world hates you, I love you. I always remember that, you know? So I was like, okay. And I just tried to put away all the, the hate and everything like that and just focus on my relationship with him. Now Dwight is in his third season with Houston. Make no mistake about it, he wants to win. He's just working hard to remember his true calling. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I just remember you know, this whole, like it was yesterday, uh, wow. When you look at that guy, how was that guy in that newspaper shot different from the guy I'm sitting across from right now? Uh, well, I would say this guy in the newspaper is full of life. Uh, no care in the world, no worry. Um, it's a young kid who didn't know anything about the world. And then the guy that's in front of you is a guy who's seen, heard, been around, been through uh, a lot of different situations. Uh, and if I was to go back and tell the guy in this picture right here, I would say never let nothing steal your joy because you're going to go through hell. That's a lesson Dwight had to learn the hard way. And today, his mission is still the same. When I'm on the floor, you know, let people see, you know, the God in me, you know, whether that be me having fun, blocking a shot and smiling, dunking and smiling, whatever it may be, but just having fun and playing with peace and joy. What has Jesus Christ meant to you? Man, just like my rock, you know what I'm saying? My foundation, when things are going wrong, when, you know, I'm at a bad place when I sin, you know, I feel like he's there. He's my foundation. Like, he hurts when I sin, but instead of him turning his back on me, it's like, hey, come back. I still love you, I'm not gonna leave. I'm here for you. We connected forever, you know, so that's, that's what he is. What an amazing athlete, isn't that remarkable, you know?
And the other big star, of the one playing now for uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, is, uh, um, you know, he went to right out of high school. These guys are big and strong and tough, but oh boy, uh, they, they, uh, he's experienced some really uh, character building uh, yeah, obstacles. I, huh? I love how he's using the NBA as his platform to preach, yeah. he said. Yeah, you know, very. Good. Tall, right. very humble, but uh, remarkable. Nice remarkable guy. guy. What you got? Well, Valentine's Day is just right around the corner. And coming up later, Squire Rushnow and Louise Duarte show you how two people in just five minutes a day can rekindle their love and restore their relationship. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A Pakistani Christian suffered torture and threats of jail for refusing to convert to Islam. Patras Hanif was targeted by his co-workers because he's Christian, according to a Vatican news agency. When he refused to renounce Christ, they threatened to charge him with blasphemy, which can carry the death penalty in Pakistan. His lawyer told the Christian Post the case is not unusual. Islamic extremists want to drive Christians out of Pakistan through violence and intimidation, even murder often targeting Christians. Well, at here at home, the sheriff of uh, York County and, uh, in Virginia is adding in God we trust to his patrol cars. Here's a photo Sheriff J.D. Diggs posted on the county's Facebook page showing the new decal. He says his goal is not to offend anyone, but to honor God, and that posting our national motto, quote, does not injure or threaten anyone. He continues, it's not an attempt to urge anyone to support or convert to any one religion. It's our national motto. And no court anywhere in the United States has ever held that the public posting of In God We Trust violates the Constitution. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, what if the communication, the respect, and the romance in your marriage could improve dramatically by investing just five minutes of your day together? Well, you're about to meet a couple who have proof that it can. Best-selling author Squire Rushnell and his wife, Louise Duarte, have been praying together since the day they married more than 15 years ago. In their book, The 40-Day Prayer Challenge, Squire and Louise explain how partnered prayer can restore relationships and the phenomenal things that happen when two people pray for five minutes a day. And please welcome back to the 700 Club, Squire Rushnell and Louise Duarte. Guys, it's so good, good to morning. see you. It's great to be back with all my old friends. I know. We'll have to like tone it down. I'm going to be all giddy because, you know, of course, we used to work together here and used to get to see you every day. <laughs> I know. But it's great to see you. Well, let's start with your personal story. How did you guys discover the power of partnered prayer? Well, we started praying together and we were absolutely astonished that so many prayers came answered. And it was also an experience that we had never had before. We had never thought of it. Like most people, we just never thought of praying together. Well, Squire, just a, a little background. Squire was married twice before. He had two, twice yeah. before. So I'm Mrs. Rushnell the yes. third. <laughs> and uh, I was married for 20 years before. Yeah. So when we started praying, in, we really saw God not only enter into our marriage, but, but we had a peace that really, surpassed all understanding, no matter what we were going through. If there was a crisis in our life or something with the kids or financially, we saw there was a solution to everything. Mm. So what we did is we went out and started talking about that with everyone about, isn't it great when, you know, a couple prays? And then we started realizing most couples really don't pray together don't. consistently. Yeah. yeah they yeah. may, you know, they pray at meals mm -hmm. or, or they'll pray, you know, during a crisis, you know, yeah. but, but they weren't praying together consistently. And so we thought, gosh, we got to get people doing this. Well, I love that you talk about the three keys. Uh, explain the importance of speaking, believing, and then expecting the answer. Well, you know, God uh, created earth and the world by speaking it. He didn't think it. Let there be light. He spoke it. And when Jesus spoke about miracles, he spoke them. And so speaking your prayer is tremendously important. Ask and believe and you will receive is what we are told in the Bible. Right. And so speaking 
and believing and expecting that your prayer will be answered is tremendously important. But we take it that extra step. And that was, and it sounds like a brand new idea, this idea of partnered prayer. Right. You know, wherever we go and we talk, people say, oh, well, that's a great new idea. <laughs> well, it's not a new idea. <laughs> Jesus had the idea when he said, if two of you yeah. will agree and believe and ask in prayer, my Father will give it, it to you. It shall be done. That's and what so, the Bible says. And so we say, yeah. just join up yeah. and partner up. And this, this whole movement that we are trying to start here, the 40-day prayer challenge, is not just about couples. Mm -hmm. Good. It is about <laughs> couples. Right. It is about two family members. It's about two friends. Mm -hmm. And we are partnered up with Baylor University and the first empirical research that's ever been done mm -hmm. on what happens when two people pray together consistently. Can you believe that? It's never that's right. been done. You, you have scientific research yes. proof yes. that partner prayer works. Yes. yes. How, how so? Well, when we went to Baylor University, we went to Barna, they said they'd never done any research. We went to Baylor, they said, well, we've never done any research, but we're gonna join you. And what, what they were able to do was to dig out some data that Gallup had done. And what they determined was that when Gallup asked the question of couples who prayed together sometimes versus a lot, that, the, that things happened differently, hmm. that romance, conversation and respect went up 20 to 30 percent when I, you pray a lot versus sometimes. And I read that one of the things that went up explan exponentially was joy and happiness. Yes, yes. joy and respect. The and yeah. the fear of divorce drops to zero. Yeah. Now, that wasn't even a, a wide report. That was something that was very small. What Baylor is about to do now and what we want people to do, because this, this is going to be historic and groundbreaking. Yeah. You go on 40daypray.com. Yeah. Mm. You go on the website, tells you everything you need to know, and then you take the survey. And it's an easy, fun survey. It's right. 10 minutes. You take it on the first day, and then you take it on the 40th day. And on the 40th day, you get a bar graph to see how how well you did, but it's in this four categories. There's married, unmarried, there's two uh, family members, and there's two friends. And mm. Wendy, I'm telling you, this is going to just blow everyone's mind because when you have data and you say, look, we've been telling you prayer works, but look, it's right here in black and white. Yeah. Louise, why five minutes a day and why, why a 40 day prayer challenge? Well, five minutes a day, we figured, okay, we're trying to make this so easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it takes five minutes to brush your teeth, to comb your hair. Can you take five minutes to be with the creator of heaven and earth and everything in it? Five minutes is all we're asking. Because right. it is a little bit of a con job because we know once they see the joy in praying, it's going to increase. But start with five minutes. God will, what God can do for five minutes of communicating with him is just so powerful. It's like plugging into the, the most powerful source in the universe. Amen. People have, it's a gift, Wendy, that's left on your doorstep and people aren't opening it up. It's going to be tremendous. Well, I know Amen. in your book, you have many examples yes. of Answer prayers. Do you want yes. to give, give us a few? Well, let me talk about, we talk about the five minutes. Right. People are so busy. That's their biggest enemy against praying together are people praying together. They're so busy. We say five minutes. That's, that's really important. We find that sometimes pastors even are so busy that they don't pray with their spouses. Mm. They, they say grace. They pray in crisis. They pray with the flock. But actually praying with their spouses, a lot of pastors are very much like the we, we were. Gee, I just didn't think of that. You know, I, I'm going to slip my mind. There's a wonderful story. Uh, Tim Keller of the Redeemer Church in New York. His wife, Kathy, had been suffering from Crohn's disease. Right. And it was right after 9-11, and there was a depression over New York. And, and that was just bearing down on Kathy. And she came to him, and she said, I need to have you do something with me, Tim. Mm. She said, I need to have you pray with me every night. Every night. Now, his mind was going, you know, I'm going to travel. I'm doing, I'm going to. She said, every night? And she said, every night. And then with the wisdom of a woman, she said, imagine a doctor told you that you were going to die. Wow. But if you took this pill mm. every day, you could live. Mm. Would you sometimes say, well, I think I'll forget about that? Or someday you'll forget about it and you'll not do it or you'll avoid it. No, you would take that pill every day. And Tim Keller said he realized that he needed to elevate prayer to a non-negotiable necessity. 
And for 15 wow. years now, he can't remember a single day that he and Kathy haven't prayed together. Mm. It is an amazing gift that is there for us to, mm -hmm. to open. That's, and that's what we do at 40daypray.com. We just tell you how to open your gift. And what is that scripture that Jesus says, whatever you ask for believing, it yes. shall be, be done. done. That's exactly right. And you know, if there's ever time to pray for Don't our country, it. it's now. Yeah. Second oh. Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Yes. It's all about, it starts at prayer. Jesus did nothing without praying first. Prayer is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. Pray. We have to pray. We got to pray just to make it today. Yes, That's we right. do. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Remember that? yeah. Well, this is so exciting. I am just savoring mm. this uh, through the 40. We've, today's the first day of Lent. That's so this right. is a it is. great time to it's pick this up. It's a good time to start. Mm -hmm. and Thousands of churches are coming on board already. Yeah. Some of the biggest churches in America, Lakewood and Gateway and Dr. Yeah. Stanley's church and A.R. Bernard's church. I mean, it's amazing to us. This is a movement that is mm. starting. And you go to 40daypray.com and join the movement. And it's That's free. That's what you need to do. There's no, there's no cost. No cost it's to the free. churches. It's wonderful. Yeah, yep. better. So everything is done. Yep. All the research is being paid for by, we'll get some angels yep. out there. So, okay, can you guys pray that I have a date by Valentine's oh. Day? Oh, well, we're going to work I mean, on right? that Wednesday. I don't know if I have faith morning. for like a full-fledged <laughs> yeah. boyfriend by Valentine's Day, but maybe a date. <laughs> oh, yeah. A oh, dinner, yeah. A dinner, done. A dinner done. date. Done. In Jesus' okay. name. In Jesus' name. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> this is an awesome, but great seeing you guys. Good to see you, Wendy. Well, for more information on the 40-day prayer challenge, just log on to CBN.com and be sure to pick up a copy of Squire and Louise's book, also called The 40-Day Prayer Challenge. It includes an eight-week study guide on unlocking the power of prayer, and it's available wherever books are sold. And this is very exciting. You have risen our expectation wow. levels, and we are ready. It so, will amaze you. Yes. I it's phenomenal. It. God no, bless no. you guys. Love you. Thank mm. you. All right. Well, coming up next, we've got your email. Vivian asks, what would happen if Christians in various parts of the world would pray in Jesus' name to bind evil demonic forces? I think we just heard something about this. We'll bring it on with Vivian's question and much more right after this. Welcome back. It is time for your email questions, and we've got Pat here, and he's ready. Vivian says, what would happen if Christians in various parts of the world would pray in Jesus' name to bind evil demonic forces? Would it make a difference in the world? Well, of course it would. God answers prayer, and uh, as you heard Squire a few minutes ago, the, the, the Lord, you bind Satan with speaking the word. In the name of Jesus, I bind your power. Mm -hmm. And if Christians collectively were praying. They could pray in particular areas. They could bind satanic power over cities, over states. We, we do that before we go on a telethon. We bind the forces of evil, Satan. And, the, and I, I think that uh, collective prayer is very important. And mm. what would it do? It would be amazing. Okay. David says, are there prophets in our world today from a biblical standpoint? If so, what is the true test of a modern-day prophet, and what are the characteristics? Well, the answer, of course, it, the Bible says they're, they're apostles, prophets, and teachers, and so forth. Uh, these are uh, ministry gifts in the church, and uh, I think the prophetic uh, gift was not so much foretelling the future as foretelling the sin and speaking directly to the sins in in people's lives. Uh, that What is a test? I mean, you know, do they speak the Word of God or not? Mm. All right. All right. Dan says, does a person still have a sinful nature after he becomes a Christian? Also, when we say sinful nature, what is actually meant by this phrase? Um, you know, if you go back to the Greek, there's a word uh, that's called, we translate it flesh. It's S-A-R-X, sarx. And uh, it, it speaks to the whole uh, nature of mankind after the fall, when there's a sinful tendency uh, in us all. We all go astray from the womb speaking lies. We, we we're sinful. So does that die? Uh, you know, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Uh, the old man, the fleshly person, has to die. And does it actually die? The answer is no. It's just dormant. 
and uh, it wants to come out and and be there, you know. And mm. Paul said, in Romans, oh sinful man, who, who will deliver me from this body of death? I mean, it's it's there in all of us, a tendency to sin. It's a constant battle till we go to be with constant, Jesus. Constant, mm. constant. Well, Miss Lisa says, will I see my parents again in heaven? My mom died in 2013. My dad died in 2003. My parents raised my sister, niece, and me, but after they died, we were separated. I don't lose my faith no matter what. Heaven is eternity with Jesus. Am I right? Well, I can't guarantee your folks are in heaven because I don't know what kind of life they live or whether they accepted Jesus as Savior, whether their sins were forgiven. Assuming that they have accepted the Lord, then yes, there'll be joyous reunions in heaven with loved ones. Uh, you know, uh, remember the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus was taken by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man wound up in hell, and, and he could see Abraham, and he could see Lazarus, and he recognized him. So there is consciousness after death. Amen. Right. Well, Vicki says, I was wondering when you read the Bible, should you read it from cover to cover or skip around? Good question. Well, I'm a skipper arounder. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to get God's Word for that particular time. Although systematic reading is, is, is very good, but I think it gets to be more of a lesson plan than it does uh, inspiration, so you can do both. Uh, I, I get sort of like, um, well, in Leviticus or someplace like that, I, yeah. I, I decide I think I want to skip around a little bit. Well, I think skipping around is <laughs> all right. Well, listen, I appreciate you being with us today, and we leave you with today's Power Minute from 2 Corinthians. For all the promises of God in Him are yes and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Well, that's all the time we've got from uh, Wendy and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.